All right, so this is our, our last in this series of going through Can God Suffer? Which will lead us, as I just mentioned, either into what is God's presence in the world like, God's role, activity in the world, or what's God's power ultimately like? How powerful is God? What can God do? Which will ultimately lead us eventually to that final question, if God is all good and all powerful, why do bad things tend to happen? But we've been looking at can God suffer and why people originally thought, okay, God can't suffer, can't have any change, any passions, any feelings. And to see some of the reasons why that shifted to people saying, okay, yeah, we think God can suffer, can suffer in Christ. Which leads us to that next kind of question. Well, if God suffered on the cross, did God die on the cross? Can God die? What does that mean? So, a lot of people here like music. We have some members of the choir. So, we don't just have songs, hymns, and things because it sounds pretty. A lot of the hymns, the Christmas carols, the anthems, they also work to proclaim God's word. They work in conjunction with the sermon. That's why we try carefully to pick hymns and anthems that fit together so they proclaim a similar message. So, a lot of really good theology in hymns. Sometimes there's some not-so-good theology in hymns. And that's why some hymns don't make it into future hymnals. But there's theology in some of these hymns that speak of God's death. So this idea of can God suffer, can God also die, or is God now dead? These questions demand considerations as part of any discussion of the suffering of God in Christ. So hymns, as much as textbooks, bear witness to the beliefs of Christianity. You can look at the history of hymns, and you will see the history of theological thought. So a number of significant hymns of the Christian church make a reference to the death of God, exulting in the paradox that the immortal God should die on the cross. Perhaps most familiar or celebrated is Charles Wesley's 18th century hymn, And Can It Be? Anybody know that song? What? Madness is this? What have we been singing in the Presbyterian church? So it's a, a classic Methodist. I grew up Methodist, so I knew it. And a lot of like modern Christian bands have done it do, too. But one of the lines uh, includes, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? These lines express the idea of immortal God being given up to death as an expression of love and commitment. This though, it is also expressed elsewhere in the same hymn as here, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies, who can explore his strange design? So even in hymns, you kind of see this idea of God perhaps dying. Then you have news headlines. We wonder how can one speak of God dying? So for a few weeks in 1965, theology hit the national headlines in the United States. Time magazine ran an edition declaring that God was dead. Slogans such as, God is dead, and the death of God became of national interest. In its uh, February 16, 1966 issue, the Christian Century provided a satirical application form for its readers to join the God is Dead Club. New terms began to appear in journals, theothanasia, theothanatology, and theothanatopsis, all fun Greek things, basically God and death. Uh, became buzzwords before happily lapsing, lapsing into fully merited obscurity. You don't see those terms a lot. But in, six, in the 60s, there's this whole kind of cult of death thing going around. You had poets like Sylvia Plath, uh, or like, you know, I died, I do it exceedingly well. There was even a branch of theology that kind of came out of England that looked at the idea of Jesus being tempted to really commit suicide by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. All these kind of ideas of Jesus and death and God, society was really thinking in terms of death during that time. So let's think about God dying in Christ. So some theologians believe that Jesus Christ has such a high profile of identification with God that one can speak of God dying in Christ. Just as God suffers in Christ, if you can suffer in Christ... Why not die in Christ? Is there a limit to how close of an identification of Jesus is God? 
Is there a line that says, well, God does this much in this form, but we're going to draw the line here. Is there such a line? Uh, so one can speak of God experiencing death or perishability. Uh, a guy named Everhard Young, a German theologian, kind of said the same thing. If God can suffer in Christ, God can experience death, perishability in Christ. Partly in reactions to developments in the U.S., especially the widespread circulation given to that slogan, God is dead, which is more cultural and sociological than theological, Everhard Jungle wrote a paper entitled The Death of the Living God in 1968, in which he argued that through the death of Christ, God becomes involved in, here's a fun German word, Vergänglichkeit. I don't know if I've pronounced that right, but it's a German word which is often translated as perishability, but perhaps is better rendered as transience or transitoriness. The Germans have these fun words for things that have all kinds of meanings that English words don't quite grab. So Jungle, who developed these ideas at greater length in God as the mystery of the world in 1983, thus sees the theme of the death of God as an important affirmation of God's self-identification with the transitory world of suffering. For God to become fully human. And we talked about uh, this a while back. This idea of uh, Gregory Nazianzus said, That which is not assumed is not healed. So for God to fully assume humanity, one of the key things that make humans humans is our mortality. Who has ever heard it said, There are two things that are actually going to happen. You're going to pay taxes and you're going to die. Those are things of being human. So if there's no chance to die, can you be said to be fully human? And this is where Christology plays such an important role in all this too. We talked about it before. I really need to do a full class on Christology to understand this. But we'd have to like stop this class, do you know a semester of Christology, then come back to this is where systematic theology is so fun. Everything hinges on everything else. So eventually we'll do a fun class just on Christology, which is understanding who Jesus Christ is. How is Jesus fully God and fully human? That's affirmed in the creeds, but how does that work? How far does it go? But for Jesus Christ to be fully God and fully human, to be fully human is to die. That's part of who we are. It's both a gift and a curse. I wrote a paper that I published like way back like years ago talking about get death as a gift. If you think about it, you know, you most books that talk about people being immortal, they're usually not real happy by the end. Because everyone they've known and loved has died. They get tired. For something to never end, it loses meaningfulness. So death really is a gift to human creatures. Tolkien wrote a lot about this with humans being able to die, the elves being immortal if you're into fantasy stuff. We can go down that rabbit hole for a long time on death. Have you seen, anybody seen the show The Good Place? So when you kind of know a little bit of what I'm talking about with, you know, this idea of heaven in this show The Good Place is it's just good forever. And it, for the people there, it eventually became meaningless because there was no end. Sometimes you have to have an end to have meaning to things. Perhaps you've experienced that at some point in your life. For something to always go on, you start to take it for granted. It starts to lose its meaning. A whole other lesson, but something to kind of think about. But for God to be fully human, does that mean God has to be able to die? Or you don't get the full human experience if you don't have death or even the fear of death? Because all of us at some point worry about death of ourselves or a loved one. If you never have that to worry about, do you really understand the human condition? And Hebrews says we have a high priest who can sympathize with us in every condition. And that's why Jesus, one of the reasons Jesus died. He understands that. So did God die too. So developing related ideas in his crucified God, which we talked a lot about, Jürgen Moltmann speaks, a little cryptically, one feels, of death in God. 
God identifies with all who suffer and die and thus shares in human suffering and death. It's kind of an identification with it. Kind of like we're getting close to it, but not quite there. It kind of reminds me of Aaron Rodgers. Is he the most smug athlete? I don't like him at the moment. He's very smug. This whole past year, he's just been kind of like, he never tells people. He always just kind of skirts around issues. If I don't want to be traded, I do want to be traded. I'm not just going to tell you what I want. I'm just going to speak cryptically and make people guess. When he was asked if he'd been vaccinated, he says, I've been immunized. He wasn't vaccinated. He did this other treatment. So he's like, I didn't lie, but I'm close to it. That's how you kind of feel with Moltmann. It's not quite God dying. You're getting something close to it. You can use similar language, but it's not the exact thing. So he's, Moltmann's, you see that he's going right up to the line, like, ooh, stopping on his tippy toes. I don't want to cross the line, but I'm going to get as close as I can to it. So death in Christ, suffering in Christ, identifying with those. So to rec he writes, to recognize God in the cross of Christ means to recognize the cross, inextricable suffering, death, and hopeless rejection in God. Moltmann makes this point using a poignant episode from a famous passage in Elie Wiesel's novel, Night, describing the execution at Auschwitz. If you read the book, perhaps remember the scene. Uh, Wiesel was watching three people die by hanging, and someone in the crowd asks, where is God? And Wiesel says, he is there, hanging in the gallows. Moltmann uses this episode to make the point that through the cross of Christ, God tastes and is affected by death. God knows what death is like. So that's different than God dying, right? Knowing what death is like. Participating in it. Understanding it. So Moltmann gets close to saying God dies but doesn't go all the way. So it kind of leaves this question, does, does God die? And the answer is, I don't know, maybe. I think it goes back to this Christology idea of Bart, right? Because we can have all these ideas of, well, can an immortal being die? Can an infinite being die? Well, how many infinite beings do we know and talk with on a daily basis? There's God. And we can't do a bunch of experiments on God. So a lot of it's just kind of philosophical guesswork, right? So in Christology, Bart had this idea. So when they're talking about finite human minds, an infinite God mind, there's all these challenges of how do you put the infinite into a finite mind? How can God enter into a mortal body? A mortal, finite mind that would blow the mind's guy's head off. How can Jesus exist with an infinite being inside it? And all kinds of science fiction kind of play with its ideas of, of a person carrying too much power that's been out made for human beings. One of my old favorite classic sci-fi shows, I'm over 11 minutes, but this is exciting, because I'm going to talk about Stargate. In the classic television show Stargate SG-1, Colonel Jack O'Neill, played by Richard Dean Anderson of MacGyver fame, accidentally downloads this depository of like ancient knowledge into his mind and it's just too much for his mind to understand so it works but it starts to eventually break him down his mind isn't built for that kind of knowledge and that was what a lot of theologians were afraid of with this kind of jesus christ god dualism how can god enter into a finite human being without exploding that god's mind that human mind Bart very simply just reversed it and said it's not so much a God entering into a mortal mind. That's hard to do, to crush the stuff, the infinite, into the finite. But really what's happening is a finite human mind is entering into the infinite consciousness of the Logos, of the second person of the Trinity, of the God. It's easy for an infinite thing to absorb a finite thing. Just little flips like that. So one of the things you can think about the death of God is, can an infinite thing die? Or, flip it around, can an infinite thing take on death and absorb it, experience it, know it, and yet still be infinite? Maybe. We don't know. Which takes us back to Bart's thing about God all along. 
He says, instead of trying to figure out all these philosophical things, this a priori stuff of before we have experience and just kind of assuming what God might be like based on our limited understanding of finite, let's just flip it around and make that infinite and come to our understanding that way. He said, no, if we believe, let's start with the point of faith. If we believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human, if Jesus Christ is the Logos, the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, then that is our best indicator of who God is. That is the experience we have. We should base our understanding of everything about God on Jesus Christ. If Jesus does it, God can do it. Which brings us to, if Jesus died on the cross, then God can die. Very simple. If Jesus does it, God does it. If Jesus weeps, God weeps. If Jesus stands with sinners, God stands with sinners. When I was a kid, we used to be told in like these ministries I went to that, you know, you're a sinner and, and God just can't come in contact with your sin because God's perfect and can't be defiled by your imperfection. They had this little like thing where they have a glass of water and put a red drop of iodine in and be like, oh, look, it contaminates the whole water. God can't be in contact with you. So I grew up all my life thinking, okay, God can't be in contact with sin. And they'd use this thing that Jesus washes us clean, and they use another little bit of bleach to like make the water clear again. But that idea of God can't be in contact with sin, it's like, well, who, who made up that rule? How is perfection destroyed by imperfection? Can't perfection subsume imperfection and make it part of perfection? If God can do it, then God can do it. And Jesus was in constant contact with sinners. So if God can be in contact with sinners, if Jesus can be in contact with sinners, what does that mean for God? God can be in contact with sinners. That doesn't somehow defile the perfection of God. So it brings back to the question, can God die? If we believe Jesus Christ died and rose again, and if we believe Jesus Christ is fully God, and I think the answer has to be, even though we don't understand how it works, and we don't have to, God can die and does experience death. And therefore, we have a God who does truly become fully human, understanding all the bits, even the tough bits about humanity, that fear and that worry of death. Because what did Christ do in the Garden of Gethsemane? before he knew he was going to be crucified. He prayed, and he worried, and he sweated blood, it says, and maybe even feared a bit. And that is to be human. And God took all of that on, and yet God is still God. That was 17-minute lessons. I apologize. Any questions? I had to round that one out. Huh? So that's a good question that we're going to do a whole sermon on that in March. So the question is, why does God, Jesus say, God, why have you forsaken me? Multiple answers to that question. Some like Jürgen Moltmann would say that is the sign that Jesus really does take on all sin. And in that moment experiences God abandonment. That God, Jesus takes on the punishment of the wages of sin is death, that we would suffer if it was all on us, this abandonment of God, and this total separation, that's why Jesus says it. I would argue Moltmann's wrong. He's a great theologian and all that stuff. I think he's wrong. Because I don't think God ever abandons us, even in sin. I think the larger picture of Scripture shows that to be true. God would never say, okay, I'm done with you, wages of sin is death, I have to be away forever. Others have argued, and there's a great article by a guy named William Stacy Johnson uh, in this book I have called Lament, in which uh, he argues that really it's a sign of the assurance that God is still with Jesus. So ancient Jews knew scripture so well, even from a young age. If they gave you a scripture, if I was a rabbi and I gave to Dave a scripture, he could tell me the scripture before and after it. It's kind of like with certain song lyrics we know so well. If I said, you know, something like, uh, uh, I'm never going to give you up, never going to let you down, and hurt you. 
See, we know the song, at least Susan knows the song, Rick Astley, you know. So certain songs we know so well. If I said, the Lord is my shepherd, you know that, you know what comes next. All I have to do is say, the Lord is my shepherd, and you know where I'm going. So the Psalm 22, the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It starts there, but it ends in the assurance, you never forsake me, God. You are right there. You bless me. Now, some argue that we're just trying to make it paint a nice picture and that we're trying to make a happy ending out of Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But remember, it's the gospel writers writing this later, and they choose every word carefully. They know they're writing the quote of Scripture. They know how it ends. They wouldn't put it in there if they didn't want people to go to the rest of the Scripture. So I think you have to take the whole of a Psalm 22 into uh, account there. Uh, so I think he says it in this sense. One, there's that feeling of God abandonment in that moment, but still the intellectual knowledge that God never does. Do you ever feel one thing, but know something different? That's to be human. You kind of feel like maybe this person doesn't love me anymore. But then part of you says, why am I thinking that? I know better than that. Sometimes our hearts and our minds aren't always on the exact same page. And I think maybe even Jesus had those moments. Because that's to be human. We'll talk a lot more about it in my sermon series for Lent. It's going to be all be on the cross. What happens on the cross? How do we understand the cross? How does the cross work? The sermon series is called Cross Talk. So we'll talk about the cross all Lent long. So we'll dive into some of these fun conundrums more then. All right, thank you very much. Next week, either starting how is God at work in the world or how powerful is God? You'll have to come and be surprised. Thank you very much.